Hello and welcome back for another video, this one on the introduction to rocks. So this video complements the earlier one of introduction to minerals. As we learned in that video, that minerals are the building blocks of rocks. So by us able to identify minerals, we're now going to be able to identify rocks. Because again, it's kind of that idea of part to whole. So let's kind of jump right in. So the first thing I want to talk about is... Well, what are rocks? Well, rocks are solid, naturally occurring mixtures of two or more minerals. What's interesting about rocks is that, yes, they include a mixture of minerals. But unlike minerals, rocks can also have and include organic material. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's the big difference. Now, if this rock happens to have economic value, we can then call it an ore, O-R-E. Uh, maybe you have a piece of granite with a quartz intrusion that has gold in it. Well, now we would say, oh, this is an ore because it has economic value. Now, moving forward, rocks have been divided into three families. There are different variations within those families, but we're going to first start off with just the three basic families. You have igneous, sedimentary, and then metamorphic. Igneous, I think of the word ignite, like in fire. So we find that that's molten material or volcanics. Very, very, very hot. The next one is going to be sedimentary. When I think of sedimentary, I think of large bodies of water where the dust and sediments that have been washed into this area can settle down and lithify. Lithification is the process of sediments turning into a mass or a solid rock. And lastly is metamorphic. And when I think of metamorphic, I think of caterpillars. A caterpillar goes into a cocoon, magic occurs, and then when the cocoon busts open, you have a completely different critter, right? You've got this beautiful butterfly. So what ends up happening is any mineral or rock can undergo change because of heat or pressure, and then you would result in a different type of material. Uh, usually it's just, it, 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 I usually teach it the sense that your material has been heated or pressured to a point that it becomes malleable, like, uh, like, taffy, saltwater taffy, so you can rearrange it. But in that process of rearranging it, you can actually shuffle up a little bit uh, the chemical composition. That's how we can see things that go from graphite to diamonds. That they're both carbon-based, but because of the heat and pressure, there's been some change, some rearrangement. Now, as we can see in our list here, that the igneous rocks can be broken into two families, either intrusive or extrusive, meaning intrusive inside the Earth's crust, extrusive on the outside, uh, other words we can use would be plutonic or volcanic. And sedimentary rocks are broken into two families, which would be chemical or clastic. Uh, chemical being solution-based or clastic being made out of clasts that have been glued together. So we'll work through this uh, into each one, but let's see what it looks like together. So the big picture would be like this. This is the rock cycle. For those that are viewing this, you can see that there are uh, blue boxes and yellow boxes. The blue boxes are the names of the material that we're going to identify, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. The yellow boxes are the process or the processes in order to get from one stage to the next. So if you want to kind of play that game, what came first, the chicken or the egg, most of us earth scientists agree that we're just, it's easier to just say that everything was igneous at that point, at the beginning of all, because when the planet after the Big Bang was molten material. As that material began to cool down because we had then an atmosphere, we can then start going through this process in which we had the development of different types of rocks. We then had the development of weathering in which rocks can be broken down into smaller bits and pieces and so on and so forth. So let's just try this real quick. I'll start at the solidification of material, which may, in this case may be an igneous rock, maybe extrusive. So we'll say that this volcano exploded, that molten material turned into a rock, into a piece of basalt. Then, because of weathering, that basalt would break down into smaller pieces. It would then be transported and deposited as a sediment. That sediment would be lithified and it would turn into a sedimentary rock. Then from here, that sedimentary rock can either be uplifted and re-weathered, 
or it could be pushed deep beneath the Earth's surface and then metamorphosed into a metamorphic rock, which that rock could then either uplift and be weathered, or it could be remelted into magma. And then that magma would then go through this process again. As you can see, these arrows go in many different directions, just you know, trying to provide you that idea that it's not a one-way street in how rocks are formed, that there are very the roads are very curved and inlets and outlets and different opportunities and changes which make it sometimes difficult to distinguish between different rocks. So we're going to look at each family individually. So we'll start off with igneous. Now many of you will have this form. You'll be filling in these diagrams as we move along. I think it's a great way to work through this process. So the first family we'll look at is igneous rocks which means forms from the cooling and solidification of lava or magma. As previously learned, lava is what is on the Earth's surface, magma is underneath. So once that magma pushes up and is pushed out into the, you know, into the air, we then identify it as lava. So the first one will be intrusive. Intrusive rocks form deep beneath the Earth's surface. And since they're deep beneath the Earth's surface, they're able to cool slowly. And since they cool slowly, the large crystals are able to develop. This is an example of an igneous rock that is intrusive. This is a piece of granite. This granite, as you can see, has very large crystals, right? You can easily see the pink squares, the white, and the black. You can really see with your visible eye that there are large crystals present. The larger the crystal, the slower the cooling process very quickly. This is how I imagine it. We're in a classroom. Each one of you has a chemical composition and you are to find bonds that will attract you to appear. So maybe you think, oh, well, I'm going to try to talk to everyone who wears glasses because I wear glasses. That's my common trait. And then you will create larger crystals. So if I told you, okay, everyone in class, quickly find someone or a group of people that you can create groups with or crystalline structures with that share a similarity, a bond, but you only have 30 seconds. That's really short. You'll have a bunch of little groups throughout the whole classroom. Now, if I do that same activity and I say you have six weeks, <laughs> probably by the end of those six weeks, there may be one or two, maybe, maybe three really large groups of people that you are all able to find bonds that connect you. So you had a longer time to bond and create larger groups or crystals. Moving forward, we can look at extrusive rocks. Extrusive rocks, the lava will cool quickly. Therefore, smaller crystals form. And it's possible that it may be vesicular, meaning that it has air bubbles. This is an example of basalt. This is an extrusive rock. I cannot see the crystals. I can see the air bubbles for sure, but I don't see any crystals. I mean, I'd have to bring out my handy dandy 10 times magnifying lens and I might be able to get in there and try to find some small crystals that are very hidden within this, but this cooled very quickly. So therefore the crystalline structure is very small. We would say that this is vesicular basalt because it has air bubbles that were trapped inside. So we have intrusive, extrusive. A fun fact since we're talking about it, we know that extrusive rocks then cool very quickly. Another extrusive rock we can talk about is what's in this little gray box. It doesn't look very exciting to you, it looks like sand, but if I turn it around, this is actually some of the ash that fell on the Earth's surface because of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. As you can see, it says Mount St. Helens ash, May 18th, 1980. It's older than you are. So this is actual volcanic ash that was then landed and deposited on the Earth's surface after the eruption of Mount St. Helens. That is also an extrusive igneous rock. All right. So here we are looking at some samples. These are igneous rocks samples. So we can see there's intrusive and extrusive. Intrusive, crystals are visible to the naked eye, going back to that piece of granite. Phaneritic, such as granite, or porphyritic, where the crystals are a little different in the sense, um, phaneritic means that the crystals are pretty much the same. You can see large clusters. 
when we talk about porphyritic, I think of chocolate chip cookies, that you all of a sudden have these really, really large, what we call xenoliths, uh, these very large crystals that kind of blurb throughout, like big chocolate chips in a cookie, but still we know that it cooled very slowly. Then we have extrusive. Crystals are very small due to the quick cooling. We know that it's affinitic. When I think of affinitic, I think of ants. Really, really small. I have no. I can see them walking, but I don't know what they're doing because they're too small to be observed with a naked eye. Intrusive versus extrusive. Let's move on to the next family. Sedimentary. So sedimentary rocks form from the compaction and cementation of sediments. Cementation, like cement, is known as lithification. It was lithified. So we have two groups. We've got clastic and we have organic and crystalline. So let's look at clastic first. Clastic sedimentary rocks are made of compacted sediment. That being said, they are also classified based on their grain size. So this is a piece of red sandstone from Zion National Park. It is a sandstone because sand implies a grain size. This is so like the beach, right? So it's kind of coarse grained. So this is red sandstone that has been cemented or lithified into a rock. Okay. We can move forward and look at things that might be organic or crystalline. We often can see them be as either evaporates, precipitates, or biological matter. An example of an evaporate would be Maybe you've done it. Maybe you've boiled a pot of water and forgot about it and came back and there was white powder in the bottom of the, of the pot. Uh, a lot of your salts that are dissolved in water, when the water evaporates, leave the salts behind. Okay. So when we look at places like Death Valley, Badwater Basin, Badwater Basin in particular is the basin of where all the water of the late Pleistocene lakes dumped their loads and the water all evaporated but leaving the minerals behind. Those are evaporates. Precipitates is a little bit different. When I think of precipitates, I think of like the photo in this background, where you have stalactites and stalagmites, where you have the dissolved material was within it, and it drabs down and pulls down, and then is left behind as the water drips away. And then lastly is biological matter. Uh, when I think of biological matter, I can think of things like, um, we'll do um, coal. A bituminous coal, which is from organic material that has been compacted and was able to turn into, into something, that a fuel, a biofuel that we can then use uh, to create energy. Another thing about sedimentary or sedimentary rocks is that that's the only time that we're able to find fossils. So I brought in a couple fossils that I thought might be helpful to observe. So this is a piece of siltstone, and as you can see, it's got a little fish on it. So that fish, when this material had you know, settled down, the fish had died, flowed to the bottom, and then he was squished. And because he was squished, he was preserved. Oh, sorry, <laughs> he was upside down. So there he is. You can see you know, his little ribs. You can see his fins and his mouth. Pretty cool, right? Another fossil, this is a trilobite. So this is uh, you know, a, one of the first multi-celled organisms. Uh, looks kind of like a cockroach. That's pretty cool. And then I think one of my favorite fossils that I've got, at least at my desk right here, is this one here. This is called coprolite. It is fossilized poop. Uh, this isn't a really important thing for us. Uh, doesn't smell, don't worry. Uh, we're talking about items that are not just thousands, but perhaps millions of years old. Fossilized coprolite is exciting because we're actually able to slice it up. And we're able to identify the species that it came from and to know what they ate and see like, wow, this fossilized piece of turd has maybe corn in it. So we know that there must have been corn available as an agriculture piece during this time, or whatever it might be. Just trying to be a little silly. Um, but that's the only time that we see uh, fossils is in the sedimentary rocks. Uh, that's mostly because there's no fire involved, no pressure involved that can then destroy it. So we have clastic versus organic and crystalline. So you know, when we think about halite, which is, uh, is a mineral, uh, it can then be dissolved into water. Uh, and then from there, it can recrystallize into rock salt as an evaporate. So let's look at this. Here's some examples. We have clastic, a mixture of clastic materials or sediments, oftentimes calcitic shells may be found. So this is a PC fossiliferous sandstone. Uh, and then we can also see some that are chemical. In this sample, uh, note the layers. This is travertine. 
uh, looks kind of like a root beer travertine in a sense, but look at the different layers. The darker layers are a mixture of calcite and organics. What's interesting about these rocks as well, so this in my hand here is a piece of limestone in a sense, right? It's limestone. Um, limestone has calcite in it, and we know that calcite reacts to acid. So this is hydrochloric acid, and before your very eyes, we will drop acid together. So here is your piece of calcite, uh, which is part of a limestone base because it has re has, uh, dissolved and then been put back together. And if I dropped a little bit of acid on here, so I don't know if you can hear or see it bubbling, but that's the noise it's making on from my side. By dropping that acid on here, I'm able to know that there's calcite in this specimen. That becomes really important moving forward when we look at different types of rocks that perhaps have been metamorphosed. And so then we would know, oh, well, this metamorphosed rock used to have calcite in it, so we were able to identify it off of that. You'll see that in a moment. Our next family, oh, sorry, and then fossils, of course. So fossils can be found in sedimentary rocks. Uh, they are preserved remains or impressions or trace of once living things. So it doesn't have to just be, you know, dinosaurs. It's everything from poop to, to leaves to fish to plants, everything. And we're it's very important for us to understand that. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, there's been a lot of research on looking at fossilized leaves because what they're able to do is look at the leaves and decide whether they have um, more of a rounded leaf shape or pointy or if they were needle based because based on the type of design the leaf had on that plant informs us as to what type of climate would have been needed in order for those trees or those that vegetation to survive. You would not find very large, broad, waxy, smooth leaves in the desert. You'd find that more in a place that would have been tropical, humid, and with a lot of precipitation. So stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. You wouldn't think that we're able to use it for that, but we can use it to actually understand ancient paleoclimates. It's pretty cool. Uh, our next group will be metamorphic. So these are materials that are changed as a result of intense heat or pressure. So that being said, we can have two types. You have contact or regional. Contact metamorphism means that there was heat. Regional means that there was pressure involved. So remember, you have enough heat or enough pressure involved to literally turn any solid material into a taffy to make it malleable so you can rearrange it and redesign it. So let's look at an example of both of these, contact and regional metamorphism. contact. Contact and regional metamorphism. So this one here, this first sample would be called a gneiss. G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. So as we can see, there's very well-defined banding. Here's a piece of gneiss in my hand. You look at those nice lines that have been well-defined. So this was probably at one point like this, a granite. And then because of the amount of heat that was involved, it was able, when it was receiving some pressure, mostly heat, but pressure as well, it was able to squish, 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 squish until you created this separation, these nice, well-defined bands. An example of regional metamorphism would be things such as this marble. Look at these nice, flat, flaky crystals that have been, well, that's a leaf for, for scale. That's a piece of marble. This is also a piece of marble very sparkly and shiny because you the crystals themselves because of the regional pressure have squished it and created these like flaky pits now what's neat about this is again drop acid if I put a little bit of acid on here pretty cool right so that implies that this must have been involved with calcite in fact marble so let me make sure I cover my acid here marble was once limestone that was then able to be squished to a point that it rebroke apart into small bits and turned into a piece of marble. Pretty cool, huh? So that could go before fossiliferous limestone can be turned into a marble. It doesn't really matter in that sense. It just changes the recipe. Those are samples of metamorphic rocks. All right. So what we're going to, going to do with this information is that we're able to then solve what are these specimens. 
if I give you an unidentified specimen, can you decide what family it belongs to? And then from there, if you have a special book, you're able to look and then distinguish the name of the rock. So what I've created for you uh, next is called a dichotomous key. Fancy word for a build your own adventure. So let's do that. I'm going to leave these here for now, these images, but we'll go to something else first. We'll look at this specimen here in my hand. And we're going to work through this one step at a time. So here it is. Uh, for those that are hard, hard to see, it's a little uh, gray green in color. We can see that there are some uh, well defined, looks like white crystals that are in lines. Uh, but you know, we don't really know what it is. So let's work through this. So question one, can you separate uh, mineral crystals in the rock that are intergrown, not glued? So does this look like it was grown together or was it glued? Well, if I'm looking at this, it's like, oh, it's really hard and solid. It doesn't seem like sand or anything like that. So yeah, I'm going to say that these were intergrown. So since I said yes, I will move on to question number two. Is the rock made up of just one kind? No, I can see different colors. So I'm going to say no. Well, if you say no, go to question four. Are the minerals in a banded or striped pattern? Well, I see some lines, but I know that banding or stripes look like this. So I'm going to say no. This does not look like that. So if I say no, I can go to number six. A rock with minerals in a mixed pattern is probably igneous rock. So now I can look at my little sheet that I've got. And I go, wait a minute. Based on the grains and the colors, I can deduct that this is a piece of andesite, which is, in fact, an igneous rock. Pretty cool, right? All right. So let's uh, look at these examples we have here. We've got the top one and the bottom one. Oh, actually, I lied. I'll save these for you so you can try them later. Well, you can go ahead and put the answers, what you think it is, in the comments. Uh, we'll look at this sample here, okay? I know, we've seen this one already, but that's okay. So question one, can you separate the minerals in the rock that were tightly intergrown and not glued? So, well, I know that this has been glued, so I'm going to go to number seven. Is the rock full of small air pockets? And I'm looking at it, and I was like, well, I don't know. I can kind of see some air pockets. I don't know. So we'll go to yes. Maybe there's some air squished within there. So then we go to number eight. A rock with small air pockets is probably igneous. Mm, no, that doesn't seem right. So let's go back to question seven. So maybe there aren't any air pockets. Maybe when they mean air pockets, they mean stuff like this. So we'll say no. So we'll go to number nine. Number nine says, does the rock look like a piece of dark broken glass? No. So go to number 11. Is the rock made up of flat plates or sheets? No. I mean, my observation, it's kind of gritty. It feels kind of sandy, and it kind of comes apart, so that's not sheets. So I'll, go, I'll go no, number 13. Does the rock have particles in it, like sand, mud, or gravel? I would say yes, so move to number 14. A rock that is made of sediments, fossils, sand, or pebbles, is a sedimentary rock. And again, this is that red piece of sandstone from Zion. So, that is a dichotomous key. This at least gives you enough information based on the tools that I provided you to be able to distinguish what family a rock is from. Is it igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic? Then from beyond that, we'll work in a lab where we get to actually look at a book that allows us to then distinguish, well, if this piece of granite, you know, is it monzonite granite? Is it going to be more of a diuretic granite? You know, those are all names that kind of distinguish, you know, based on colors of crystals, the volume, is it more black, more white, more pink, whatever it might be. But this is just, again, simplification. So again, I have provided for you two samples, this one and that one. Go ahead and solve it. Write what you think it is in the comments, okay? Um, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end you on actually on this slide of the rock cycle. It's an important thing for us to know as earth scientists because it allows us to understand the landscape that we see. So when we go out and we're hiking around and we're looking at a, at a mountain or we're looking at these, this maybe a large uh, monolith or something like that, uh, we're able to look at it, use our loop lens, we're able to break it apart in our mind and to go, well, this is what this is made out of. This, you know, as an example, maybe you've been to Yosemite. Yosemite is one of the hardest granites in the world because it cooled very slowly. 
Then it warmed up again. You know, like it just kind of got reheated like in a microwave. And then it cooled down again and then reheated and cooled down again. So the crystals got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not uncommon to find a crystal. Uh, as an example, this is a piece of feldspar. This is a really large piece of feldspar, but it's not uncommon to find them this big in Yosemite. I mean, oh, this big, right? Um, because it has so long to cool down. So it's pretty cool. The more you know, the more you can understand, and the more you know about your environment you stand facing. I hope you enjoyed. We'll talk soon.